Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Lori Carlin. I'm with Delta Think. I'm uh, the Director of Marketing. And um, I've been with Delta Think for several years now. Prior to that, I worked with many individual associations, um, both at those associations and with the small size publisher that serviced associations. So I have experience. We'll see. Um, We'll see how that experience translates into uh, information that you, you can use. So um, the question I'm going to answer today is really, you've developed your product. You've gone through the product development that uh, my fellow panelists have talked about. And now what? You've got the product. You're ready to launch. And you want to make sure that you are speaking to those users. Um, but my panelists have talked a lot about making sure that you've got the voice of your member, voice of your user, voice of your reader, your author, whatever that may be, incorporated into your product development. And you want to continue that when you are launching and as you are going through your life cycle management. And there are a number of different ways that you can gather that information from, from your customers. Um, some align with that ideation and that innovation phase. Some align with that product development phase as you are really building out and developing your product and understanding what the features and functionality are. And some align with that product being launched and being in use um, and really gathering feedback and understanding what your customer needs are. So how how do you decide what that is? Many of you may have seen this slide before. We use it a lot at Delta Think. Uh, we like to break that market research customer insight down into different levels. What is it that you're trying to achieve? Do you want to get that level one customer insight back? Um, do you want to understand on a broad level from a large group of people what are they doing? Uh, what products are they using? What are their opinions? Get that data back and information. Do you want to look at your competitors and see what's out there in the landscape? How are they messaging? Who are they targeting? What is it that they're um, featuring in their information? Do you want to be at that level, too, where you're talking with folks and really getting a little bit more about the motivations behind their behaviors? Or are you at a level three? where you really want to shadow people, you want to be in their workflow, you want to understand contextually how they are doing their work, how they're going through their day, and where your product or service may help them with their challenges or frustrations. So we really like to talk about the why, and I really like this little cartoon because I think it just says why the why is important. Um, just asking that question and finding out what somebody what somebody's answer is is not telling you why and if you don't understand the why then you can't build your marketing messaging to to really resonate with them and really understand what um, their challenges are and how you're going to help them and then in terms of the product development life cycle and how marketing fits in and how your customer insight fits in it really you know as we've said along the way in the panel it really goes throughout the entire life cycle of this product development and then into launch and post launch it's not just um, at one phase or another in the cycle but all throughout I'm going to focus now a little bit more on the launch and post-launch, but a lot of the things I'm talking about really can be used to gather that customer insight that we've been talking about for the last 45 minutes or so. So I'm, I'm going to talk now about the specific customer insight techniques that you can use and maybe give you a little bit of information on how you can um, implement those customer insight programs that uh, my fellow panelists have mentioned. And we're, as I said, we're going to focus on launch and post-launch and life cycle management phase because once that product comes to market, you're not done. Um, you want to continue to understand what the customer thinks about the product, how they're using the product, how you can enhance the product going forward, and you can continue to make sure that that product has life well beyond uh, launch and well into the future. 
So here I just have um, a small toolkit for you of some of the different techniques or tactics that you can use to get this customer insight both uh, or at launch, pre-launch as you're building your launch plans and at launch, post-launch when you want to audit your product and, your, and see how your members and your users are interacting with the product and what their thoughts are on the product. And then as you move into your life cycle management, and now you want to keep enhancing and building on that product and making sure that the information that you're providing is resonating with those uh, users and members and customers. So I'll start with customer surveys. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on this. Most of you have probably used surveys in your customer insight building. They're a relatively versatile and inexpensive tool that you can use. You really get to collect data on attitudes, opinions, the values, information that you can use to trend and track um, activities of your, of your communities. Uh, words of caution, you want to make sure that you're looking at the right sample sizes that you're not going after a biased population. You're not surveying all the people who love you and love your product. You want to make sure you're talking to folks who maybe not, maybe don't know you're about your product. Maybe you're using other products to find out what it is that they like about those. And, um, and making sure that you're segmenting. So in this little example here, if you can, if you can make it out, um, this is just an example of how you might want to segment the, that information. So you can see where at the top bar you've got um, what they really value very highly uh, as, and I, I'm having trouble actually reading that, but, um, and you can see where everyone's pretty well aligned up at that top. But if you move down to, I think it's prestige, you can see where Latin America really finds prestige to be really important to them. So you want to hone in on those different messages, that different, those different pieces of information that resonate with your different audiences. So in-depth interviews. This happens to be um, one of my favorite techniques for gathering information from your customers. Um, it's really, really a great way to get in-depth information from people, have a conversation with them, and really understand those motivations behind their um, behaviors. And uh, they don't have to be a high, a heavy lift. It's something that can be done over the phone. Um, you want to make sure that you've got set talking points so that you are asking the same questions to your, to your folks, and you can really aggregate information and compare information. Um, across your various interviewees. Usually they last about 30 to 60 minutes and usually we recommend four to six audience members per segment. And you start to see once you get to about four, sometimes a little bit more, that you start to hear the same things over and over again from folks and you can really start to hone in on what is that message that will resonate across the market, across that audience segment. Just a little bit of information on what makes in-depth interviews, um, why we use them, and what might make them better than focus groups in certain instances. And focus groups are a great way to gather information as well. But in the in-depth interviews, you may find that there are people who will talk more freely when they are um, speaking alone. They're not biased or influenced by their peers or thinking, uh, should I say that in this group? Um, it really allows them to have that, that free speech. And um, you can explore, you can ask follow-up questions and really explore their needs and their behaviors and really ask them why while you're talking to them. And things may come up that are off script and you can really um, dig in deeper as you're conducting the interviews. Um, audience journeys, another really important piece in your path in understanding your customer. So you've done your surveys, you've done your interviews, you've, you understand from your audiences and your stakeholders what it is 
um, you've gotten those insights from them. And now you want to build out your audience journey. You really want to understand what action you want them to take. That's really important. What is it that you're trying to achieve here? What action um, is it that you want them to, to do moving forward? And then what is it that they have to believe in order to do that? And you've learned that um, through, your, through your discussions of your product. You, wanted, you want to be able to say, well, they need to believe that my product, my service, my journal is really the top one or is going to change their workflow. It was going to address the challenges that we heard that they have. This is going to answer those questions for them. And then understanding what they currently believe. What did you hear during that insight in terms of other products they may be using, other services, your services, your products? And taking that and building that out into what it is you believe that they currently are, um, is in their minds. And then what potential hurdles might there be in this process? Do they have attitudes? that may get in the way? Do they believe that if their mentor hasn't recommended this to them, then it's not the right product? Um, does they, do they have institutional mandates that allow them or don't allow them to move in certain directions? Do they not have funding for a certain service or product? So really understanding where your audience member is and where you want them to be and how you're going to get them there. And then uh, customer advisory boards. And Mark, in particular, had mentioned this as well. Um, really is a way to continually, through that life cycle management, to understand how your customers are using your product, what's important to them, what resonates with them. You know, Going to them for messaging, for design, for features, terminology, workflow, all of those things that you can run past them and really get that input from those customers, from those users, from those members, and really make sure that their voice is part of your process. Some of the practices um, about developing those, those customer advisory boards, you know, you want to make sure that you are ready to listen to them, that you don't believe that you have the answers and that you really want to hear from those customers and get their feedback. Uh, have a strong moderator, someone who really can help lead the conversation and really motivate them and keep the momentum going. And consider offering them compensation. That's an operational piece, but they're professionals. You value their opinion. You want to make sure that, that you show them that there's a value in what they're providing. All right, so just very quickly, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, taking this customer insight and now moving it into your, your strategy. So you want to have that insight to help you develop your differentiators. <clears throat> really understand what's important to your customer. What is it about your product or other products that they use or other services that they use that they really value? Um, and then using that to hone in on your positioning statement and having that be a statement that everyone on your team, your product development team, your marketing team, all of the folks who are involved with that product really understand and, and have as a mantra. Uh, because you want everybody to be speaking with the same voice and you want everybody to be using the same language to reinforce the benefits and the, the attributes of your product. And then building out that audience journey that I talked about before from what they currently believe to what you want them to believe and, and understanding that path that they're taking so that you can map out your processes based on their path. Oops, wrong way. Okay, and then um, mapping out your plan by those audience segments. So making sure that you're really using this customer insight information, not broadly, not taking a grand splash across everyone and assuming everything will resonate the same with everyone. Um, if you have early career people, they're going to want to hear something different than your folks who are mid-career or later career. You want to understand what is important to them, what the differentiators are, how they prefer to have information delivered, all that information that you gathered from your customer insight, and use that to map out your plan. 
And then finally, measure success. Really important, um, maybe obvious, but oftentimes lost in the shuffle. Make sure that you're looking at your numbers, you're looking at your metrics, you're tweaking, you're changing, you're getting rid of things that don't work and replacing them with things that do. Paul talked a little bit earlier uh, in the morning session about failing fast. The same thing applies here. If something's not working for you, you need to move on to something else and try, try new things. Thank you. Thank you all. We have a, we have a few minutes uh, for questions. So I invite you to, yep. Laurie just talked about customer advisory boards. Do you have any, we're talking about, say, subscriptions here. Would you, you envision a way to make those more accessible to people who purchase those subscriptions or the researchers or the users? Hi, okay. <laughs> um, I think that you want to segment your customer advisory boards just as you would segment your other uh, customer insight activities. So you can have two different boards and have one of librarians and one of um, your users and, and be using them for different purposes. You know, your librarians are the gatekeepers. They're going to be, there's certain questions that you're going to be interested in running by them, certain features and functionality that's applicable to them. Your users are, have different needs and different, um, there's different features and functionality and messaging that's important to them. So in that situation, I would actually suggest that you have both if they're, those are both customer groups that are really important to you. Fascinated by the, um, I think it was the the JAMA presentation about all the different roles. Um, how would you suggest dealing with um, product management and project management with a much stronger team or with a smaller team um, with overlapping roles? Uh, how, how could you see that working? I think this is, yeah. Um, each one of those buckets could be one person, I think. Like if you think back to the chart where there's, there's like four in a row, um, they expand over time based on like need or, or resources that you have. But you need someone, you can have a project product person who knows what that means. And you can have a BA and a tech lead that's the same thing. And you can have um, a developer but it's really difficult if you have a developer who's a product manager and a tech lead. And those are almost as problematic as a 30 person group doing product management. And they're like, you need to have some sort of handoff checks and balance to correct each other. Um, but you can, I, the chart's meant to be, you know, you can kind of expand or simplify based on what you need to do or what your resources are. Thank you very much.